Sampling a signal involves discarding all of the information in that signal that's in between the samples. And this has several important consequences. We're going to look at some of those in this video and obtain some guidelines for choosing the interval between samples and also discover the phenomenon of aliasing. So recall that we're taking a continuous time signal and we're using an analog to digital converter to sample that signal at intervals of T sub s and obtain a discrete time signal, which is the continuous time signal evaluated at integer multiples of the sampling interval. We can also define the sampling frequency, f sub s, as the inverse of the sampling interval. And the units on f sub s would be in hertz, provided the units on t sub s are in seconds. We get to choose the sampling interval, and there's some trade-offs involved. Specifically, if we choose a smaller sampling interval, we end up with more samples for a given amount of time, which requires more storage. If we choose a larger sampling interval, there's fewer samples and less storage. Similarly, the smaller T sub s generally is going to require more expensive analog to digital converter, as well as the other hardware that's involved. Now, a smaller sampling interval also makes it easier to do reconstruction. Now, sampling in general for an arbitrary signal might seem difficult to understand, but we can simplify it by studying how sinusoids are sampled and then extrapolate those results to an arbitrary signal because any x of t can be expressed as a sum of complex sinusoids. So recall, if we have some complex sinusoid x of t with frequency f0, we can view that in the complex plane as an arrow, it's rotating at rate f0. So this completes f0 cycles of rotation per second. Now if we sample x of t, then we obtain x of n. And replacing t with n t sub s, we have e to the j 2 pi f0 t sub s times n. And we'll group the f0 and the t sub s into a new symbol, f0 hat. We have e to the j 2 pi f0 hat n. Now f0 hat is this product, and I can also write it as the ratio of f0 to the sampling frequency. So we're going to use a hat over f to denote discrete time frequency, and the units on that are cycles per second, which would be the units on continuous time frequency, times seconds per sample, which are the units on t sub s, and therefore f hat has units of cycles per sample. So let's look at a specific example. I'll assume that x of t is e to the j 2 pi times t. In other words, f0 is 1. And we'll set the sampling interval to 1 8 of a second. And that gives x of n, the discrete time sinusoid, as e to the j 2 pi times 1 8 n, or e to the j pi over 4 times n. The discrete time frequency f hat is 1 8 cycles per sample. We can interpret the discrete time sinusoid in terms of the complex plane, just like we did the continuous time sinusoid. So let's start at n equals 0. Then I have e to the j 0, which is this point here on the real axis. When I go to n equals 1, I have e to the j pi over 4 times 1. So I'm at an angle of pi over 4 and a length of 1. And then at sample 2, I move another pi over 4 radians to this point, and sample 3, another pi over 4, to this point, and so on. And you can see that in this case, there are exactly 8 samples in one cycle. f hat is 1 8 cycles per sample. So what's happening is my continuous time sinusoid is rotating continuously, and it's as if I took a strobe light or a snapshot with a camera flash at different instants to capture each of these samples. Now we can look at the real part of that example, which will give us a cosine. So x of t is depicted in orange here, and then x of n is cosine 2 pi times 1 8 n. And when I evaluate that at n equals 1, that corresponds to t equals 1 8, so I obtain this sample. And then n equals 2 is the sample which is a zero crossing. Now let's suppose we change the sampling interval. Well, what happens if we choose t sub s equal one second? Remember that this rotating vector representing the complex sinusoid is rotating at one cycle per second. 
So if I take samples at intervals of one second, I'm only going to capture this rotating vector once per cycle. In this case, you can do the math as well. You can substitute t sub s equals 1, and you end up with e to the j 2 pi n for x of n. And that evaluates exactly to 1 for n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 2, and so on. So I'm only getting one value. So the continuous time sinusoid was rotating at one cycle per second, and yet when I've sampled it, I only capture a single value, and that's the same value for every choice of n. Now, if I look at the real part of this complex sinusoid, then I had a cosine for my continuous time sinusoid, and when I sample that, I get cosine 2 pi times n, which is exactly equal to 1. And the plot depicts the continuous time sinusoid in orange, and then the samples in green, and you can see that we're sampling the continuous time sinusoid at every peak. So there's some confusion that's possible here when we sample these signals, and this is a consequence of not sampling frequently enough. What reconstruction does is it tries to find the simplest signal corresponding to the samples. That's because we're kind of connecting the dots with a smooth curve. When we say the simplest signal, in terms of sinusoids, that would be the lowest frequency signal. So in this case that I've shown a moment ago with t sub s equal one second, and we're sampling cosine two pi t, we end up with samples that are exactly equal to one. And if I reconstruct that, I'm gonna get a sinusoid that has frequency zero. In other words, y of t is exactly one, because that's the simplest signal that corresponds to the sample. This process where a sinusoid of one frequency appears as a sinusoid of a different frequency is called aliasing. So let's take another example. Suppose I have x of t is equal to e to the j 2 pi times 10 t. So this is a sinusoid with frequency 10 hertz, and my representation in the complex plane is a vector that's rotating 10 times a second. And if I sample that at t sub s equal 1 12th of a second, then I end up with x of n being e to the j 2 pi 5 6 times n. f hat, my discrete time frequency, is 5 6. And I've drawn some of the samples of this particular signal. At 0, we have a sample that's on the real axis. And then I'm going to rotate 5 pi over 3 radians, or 5 6 of the way around the circle, to get my first sample at n equal 1. And then from this sample, I'm going to rotate another 5 pi over 3 radians, and that brings me to the sample labeled n equal 2. And so on, I get to n equal 3 and n equal 4. Now there's an ambiguity here, because although I obtained these samples by going forward by 5 pi over 3 radians, I could have gone negative pi over 3 radians and obtained the same set of samples. And indeed, if I take my sampled signal, e to the j 2 pi times 5 6 times n, and I subtract 2 pi n, because e to the j 2 pi n is exactly 1, then I have 5 6 minus 1, or e to the minus j 2 pi 1 6 n. Whereas the original signal that I sampled was going around 5 6 of a revolution before I got the first sample, what this expression is saying that it's equivalent to going negative one-sixth of a rotation to the first sample, and negative one-sixth of a rotation to the next sample, and negative one-sixth of a rotation to the third sample, and so on. This is aliasing. A sinusoid with discrete time frequency five-sixth cycles per sample is equivalent to one with discrete time frequency negative one-sixth cycle per sample. In this particular case, f hat and f hat minus 1 are identical sinusoids. Now you can extend what we've done here graphically to show the samples I obtained with a complex sinusoid e to the j 2 pi f hat times n, that those samples are identical to a sinusoid that I would obtain with a frequency f hat plus l cycles per sample, where L is an integer. If I go an extra revolution or two between samples, I'm going to end up at the exact same point. So let's state this 
ambiguity between the frequencies when I sample in terms of what it means for reconstruction. If I start out with a complex sinusoid, e to the j 2 pi f naught t, and I sample that at t sub s, that's going to give me a digital or discrete time frequency, f hat, equal to f naught times t sub s cycles per sample. And then if I reconstruct that, remember I'm going to choose the simplest signal that fits the sample, or in other words, in terms of a sinusoid, that's going to be the lowest frequency sinusoid that matches the samples. What I'm going to get out is e to the j 2 pi f sub a t. And f sub a is not necessarily equal to f naught. If I don't sample fast enough, I can have aliasing where f a is different from f naught. Now the formula for f a is f sub s times the smallest digital frequency where I can add integer rotations to the digital frequency that I obtain here with f naught times t sub s. So we'll choose the number of rotations so that f hat plus l has the smallest possible absolute value. Now real signals only have positive frequency. Negative frequency doesn't have a meaning. And you can see that cosine of a negative frequency is identical to cosine of a positive frequency. Now you might say, well, sine of a negative frequency is the negative of a sine with the positive frequency. That's true, but I don't know the amplitude of the signal when I'm doing reconstruction, so a negative amplitude is equally valid as a positive amplitude. So what happens with a real signal is that f naught, a cosine with frequency f naught, goes to a cosine with digital frequency f hat being equal to f naught times t sub s, and then that gets reconstructed as a cosine with frequency f a, where f a is f sub s times the smallest absolute digital frequency consistent with the samples. That is t sub s times the minimum with respect to l of f hat plus l, where again l is an integer. Now it's much easier to see this in graphical form than it is in equation form. So this is how we figure this out graphically. First of all, we're going to sketch the angle 2 pi times f hat. That's the digital frequency in radians. So I've sketched an example, 2 pi times f hat. And then we're going to let theta be the principal angle corresponding to this. Remember, the principal angle is between minus pi and pi. So in this case, theta is a negative angle with respect to the real axis, as shown here in purple. Then the apparent frequency of the reconstructed sinusoid is going to be the absolute value of this angle divided by 2 pi times t sub s. And all of this analysis leads us to the sampling theorem, which is saying for the sampled signal, to have the same reconstructed frequency as the original signal, this angle, 2 pi f hat, has to be less than pi, or f hat has to be less than 1 half. Now, if f hat is less than 1 half, then 1 over t sub s has to be greater than 2 times f naught. And if we sample a signal at this rate, where 1 over t sub s, or the sampling frequency f sub s, is greater than twice the frequency of the signal, we won't have this aliasing happen when we use reconstruction. Because the simplest signal, or the lowest frequency, is going to be identical to the frequency that was sampled. Our principal angle will be identical to the angle, and it will lie in either the first or the second quadrant. When I reconstruct my actual frequency, I'm just going to end up back with the frequency that I sampled to begin with.